Hello and welcome to the second session of our workshop series about Formula Student by SimScale in collaboration with Formula Student Germany. I would like to welcome you very warmly and first of all make sure that um, the webinar broadcasting is working well for everyone. Uh, so therefore, guys, you will find a button which is called raise your hand and in the case you can hear me loud and clearly, please click the raise your hand button and I know that everything is working fine. Great, I already see a lot of hands and by the way, already a lot of names I can remember from former email con uh, conversations we had. And um, in the case, uh, for some reason, the, the quality of the audio stream should drop. Uh, please um, feel free to use our toll-free audio service numbers. You can find for different country different toll-free numbers and you just have to enter this access code 991-502-345 uh, to join the, the audio stream via phone. Um, by the way, since you had so many questions last time, today I got su I get support by my colleagues Anna and Akram, which will answer your questions in the chat. So if you have a question, just, just write into our question window and we will answer it directly in this question chat or later during the Q&A. Um, great, then let's take a look at our today's agenda. Last week we had a very great introduction to the fundamentals of aerodynamic by our guest speaker Rene Hillhorst and uh, today we want to gain this knowledge and help you to create the very first, uh, your very first CFD simulation of a forecast. So therefore we will talk today a lot about forecast CFD models and therefore I will give you introduction to advanced CFD modeling then I will show you a live demo how I will set up a, a external fluid flow simulation of a former student car and after that we will discuss the next homework and we will have time for your Q&A. And um, just, just one thing I would like to talk with you about, uh, you may notice that in the last uh, days uh, you had to wait uh, some time for, for a job to launch it. The reason is that we were surprised by uh, the high number of participants joining this workshop and before we made some assumptions it will be less participants and therefore we planned uh, less computational capacities. Uh, nevertheless, we have extended the uh, homework deadline for the first homework to end of this week. And in addition, um, if your job was not starting, we will also accept the homework. Uh, if you have questions regarding that, just check out the forum or your email inbox. I sent you um, a link regarding that. Okay, and just one question I would like to answer uh, uh, directly right now. Uh, Tobias wanted to know if it's possible to to simulate in private uh, since they want to try different setups for their car. And uh, yes, Tobias, that's possible. We have our so-called professional subscription and the great thing about this workshop series is that your team can qualify for your free professional subscription by submitting all four homeworks. Great, then let's start. And first of all, since we have some guys who joined the first time today, let's just take a look at uh, the syllabus of our workshop. Last week, as I mentioned, we had our general introduction to aerodynamics by René Hillhorst. He talked with you about um, fundamentals of aerodynamics, so what is, first of all, what is viscosity, etc., but also about wing theory, different concepts for generating wings, and he also showed how to start with designing a new wing profile, a new wing. Today we will expand this knowledge, so the title of our uh, session today is Complete Car Aerodynamics, and we will mainly talk about one point, which is complete car CFD with a focus on Formula Student, for Formula SAE. And there we'll talk also about two, uh, two points which are very important for complete car CFD simulation, wall modeling as well as real and radiator modeling. And uh, just to give you a, a short outlook what we will do next week and uh, uh, we will next week then really start to talk about how to leverage CFD to optimize the car. So uh, if you've expected to learn how to improve your car, you're absolutely right here. 
but you have to be patient one week because first of all we have to make sure that everybody knows the fundamentals to be able to use a simulation because the long-term uh, aim for us for sure is that every single participant is only is able to leverage SimScale for his or her formal student design. Great then, let's start. And um, he has already talked about um, the homework assignment, so you're invited to work on this voluntary assignments and the benefits is that you will get a certification for your CV, a professional training and a free professional subscription for your team. Great, then let's directly start to talk about advanced CFD modeling. And first of all, um, you might remember that we had a demo last week where I showed you how to create a, or how to set up a simulation of a former student front wing. And uh, since you learned so much in, in a short time last week, I would just like to talk about some fundamental steps we discussed last week. And if you take a look at the screen, you will see different um, uh, words which you, I'm quite sure, have heard last week. And since a lot of, there were a lot of questions, I would just like to discuss briefly with you the meaning of these words because basically that are, let's say, the six components you need for a successful CFD simulation. First of all, let's let's start with the mesh. Um, actually. Um, Let's make it very simple. As you know, CFD is based on very complex equations, so-called Navier-Stokes equations. This equation are uh, partial differential equations. And unfortunately, no computer in the world would be able to solve the equation analytically. Just, just imagine, if you would like to solve it analytically, you would need independent or unlimited, unlimited memory because then you would need for every point in your fluid domain uh, information. And basically, it's, it's very simple what the mesh does. It's uh, something uh, every one of us came across the situation. Just imagine you have a very big problem and you would like to divide it in small parts. And that's what smashing is doing, basically. And uh, if you want to take a look from the physical mathematical perspective, what we're doing here is approximating these differential equations with a finite volume approach. And so with the mesh you control where you want to compute velocity and pressure. So if you take a look at this car, uh, you will only compute pressure velocity of the flow around the car for every every cell of the mesh. Next two points which are very important, initial conditions, boundary conditions. As I mentioned, um, this, this solving this equation is, is quite hard. And since we're using a numerical approach which is uh, based on iterative solving of these equations, we need a starting point. And you have to just imagine this like that. Um, what we are doing is, what, or what we want to know in the end is, we want to know pressure and velocity distribution around and on the car. And our problem is that we can't solve this equation analytically. And now we will take uh, 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 um, a approximate um, uh, process like, like finite volume. And we need a starting point because the idea is I will can calculate like the error of my solution and improve my overall result by recalculating it again and again. And here we talk about initial condition. And in the end, it's uh, we cannot solve this problem directly. But uh, just imagine it's like someone asks you a question, a certain problem of sign or mathematics, and you don't know the answer. But as soon as the teacher gives you a hint about the answer, you can solve the problem. And that's what we do with initial conditions. We give the simulation tool a hint about the result we're expecting. Boundary conditions, in contrast to that, are very easy to understand. Um, boundary conditions are, let's say, conditions the final simulation res result has to fulfill. For example, the velocity on the surface of the car is zero. And this boundary condition helps us to solve this equation. Without boundary conditions, we, conditions, we, we were not able to, to, to solve the equation numerically. 
And in the end, technically, boundary conditions are those values assigned to a specific set of cells which have to be physically true to obtain a correct solution. So the user cannot get a correct solution with the wrong boundary condition and therefore the boundary conditions are very, very important. Um, numerical settings, I don't want to talk too much about it. Basically, um, I told, I, I mentioned several times we are using numerical uh, tools to, to solve, um, numerical algorithms to solve the equation and therefore we have to decide which algorithms and schemes we want to use. And this is something which we call numerical settings. And finally, we have two points. One point, you may heard about the turbulence modeling. We will talk about it in five minutes more in general. Um, and the last point is a solver. In the end, the solver is just the, the code in the end, uh, which is, is, is solving our mathematical uh, problem. Great. Okay. Um, if you have questions, as I mentioned, just write them into our question window box. And now I would like to talk with you about something else, about turbulence. <laughs> and uh, I know this term is used a lot, but basically a lot of people have really misconceptions about what turbulence is. So let's try to explore it together. First of all, maybe just for me to, to get an idea about what you know. Can maybe everyone raise his hands who knows what turbulence is? I see some hands, but not so many, so I think we may should talk about this a little bit more in detail. First of all, to put it in a nutshell, turbulence is a chaotic change of, of field values in space and time, which means like your pressure, your velocity is changing uh, very fast and chaotic. And space and time means locally as well as uh, 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 over the time. And um, just imagine here I, I uh, have, have um, water which is uh, uh, flowing and if you would just open this valve a little bit you would see the water com uh, coming out of, of this pipe and you would also see that the structure is very regular and will not change. And if you increase, let's say, the um, mass flow through the pipe, you will see that the profile of, of, of the water uh, will change and it becomes more and more chaotic. But if you now replace this water by oil, let's say oil, with a much higher viscosity, you will see that this effect will, will stop and it again looks very regular. And basically, um, this is uh, something which can be expressed with the Reynolds number. And we talked about it, I think, last week a little bit. Uh, Rene already introduced it to you. The Reynolds number can be calculated as a product of the velocity multiplied with the characteristic length, the density divided by the viscosity. And this is representing, in the end, uh, the um, relationship between inertial forces and viscous forces. And if a, question, a flow is um, turbulent or laminar, it's in the end a question of the Reynolds number. It only depends on the Reynolds number. And now we have a big problem. Just imagine you, I, I, something, nearly every real flow is turbulent. Every flow around your car will be turbulent. And now we have a big problem because uh, as you can remember, last time we made the simulation, we made a steady state simulation, assuming nothing will change over time. But if we know that turbulence means we have a chaotic change of field values, that's basically not true. So how can we solve this problem? And what we are doing in the end when running a steady state fluid flow simulation is, just imagine this would be a graph representing for a, for a fixed location uh, in my fluid domain how the local velocity changes. And the idea is I can average it and represent this curve by average value plus a fluctuation. 
let's call the average, uh, the average value is red and the fluctuation is blue. And these oscillations, they occur on very different time and length scales, as you can see here. And if you would like to calculate these length scales, you need a lot of uh, computational power, more than we could basically provide. <laughs> DNS is really, it's called DNS, Direct Numerical Simulation. It's really, really hard and consuming a lot of time and consuming a lot of computational resources. But there is an approach which is very nice and can help us here. We will just say there are no oscillations. <laughs> we only have average value. But then you will say, how will that work? I cannot just say this is not happening and it's actually physically happening. Will that not have a negative impact on my results? And it, it would have a negative impact on the results, but uh, we can do something else. We can introduce something we call effective viscosity. We talked about viscosity and we have a physical viscosity, which we can physically measure in the fluid. And we will now introduce something new, which we call turbulent viscosity. And just before you try to understand the physical meaning of turbulent viscosity, there is no physical meaning. It's just a cheap trick. But the good thing is, uh, by introducing this uh, vis uh, uh, um, turbulent viscosity, I don't have to calculate again uh, um, the oscillations. I can replace oscillations and close my equation system by replacing the physical re viscosity with the effective viscosity. And then I can use models, which are called turbulence models, to calculate the turbulence viscosity with statistical models, for example. And that's what we do. Now we calculate the turbulence as an <laughs> additional transport property instead of solving velocity and pressure fluctuation for all time and length scales. And this is for sure a simplification and therefore it's not valid in general. And if you talk with a, uh, let's say, s uh, researcher who is working in the field of, of boundary layer research, she will tell you that it is wrong. But it's right enough for our purpose. And in F1, in Formula 1, they are also using turbulence models because it would not be possible to directly simulate all the scales. Great. And there are a lot of different turbulence models, depending on the application, on the tool you're using. And in the end, the idea of all those turbulence models is to put in a nutshell, to reduce the effort calculation, uh, for, for calculation uh, of, of, of uh, all scales of the flow field, and calculate instead turbulences as a transport property. And therefore, we will introduce their new new properties. Uh, and this is very important. Basically what happens is I have kinetic energy in my flow and this kinetic energy is dissipated into uh, vortices. And um, these vortices are, we start with big ones and they become smaller and smaller and uh, in the end they will dissipate till they are, let's say, gone. <laughs> and we could now talk for hours about turbulence modeling, but let's make it crisp because we want to make you CFD expert formula student and not CFD experts for theory. So we will use, or I would, we recommend you to use for all formula student related applications, a so-called K omega SST model. K omega SST model is a very nice model because it's basically made of two models and it switched automatically between a K epsilon and a K omega mod model. MK is the kinetic energy of, of uh, the vertex of the, of the flow, of the turbulence, the turbulent kinetic energy and omega and epsilon are different ways of express the dissipation rate. And what we do is we use K omega in the near off walls because it's very strong for high pressure gradients and we will use k epsilon far away from the wall because it's very uh, strong for calculating or for uh, modeling the free stream. And that's basically the idea. 
Um, and um, you may remember last week I just gave you some random values for k and omega. For sure they were not, not, not random. We calculate them on our own. And you can or you have basically to calculate the rate k and omega values as boundary conditions for your simulation. But um, the good thing is that we will provide you later on with the Excel tool which can calculate this automatically. Basically it's also not very hard. But since we want to put the focus today on understanding simulation, we will talk about this more in detail in the last session, which is about how to adapt the knowledge you gained on your own car design. Great, just because I saw some questions. Um, Mislav wants to know, uh, in turbulence modeling, if we are replacing physical viscosity with or with what we are replacing it. We are replacing the physical viscosity with our so-called effective viscosity, so we're adding additional term for turbulent viscosity. Bislav, I hope this answered your question. Um, <laughs> next question is by um, uh, Bitadu about the difference between k epsilon and k omega. I hope this was already answered. Um, otherwise my colleagues will write you a, a, a answer in more detail, but I think it's not very important to talk about this too much in detail for, for understanding or for using it. Okay, then I would say we are ready to talk about the next very important aspect. And I think you can remember the slide, can't you, right? This is a slide uh, we showed last week when René talked about the boundary layer. Uh, maybe just to see uh, uh, what you learned last week. You can just write it into the question of the chat window. What are most important things we have to know about the boundary condition? Any ideas? Guys, come on. What is the difference between the flow around, let's say, far away from the wall and the flow in the near of the wall? Exactly. Itty gave the right, right answer. Chris also. Sebastian also. It's the velocity profile. Exactly. And on the wall, Maximus writes the velocity is zero. And you can see it here on the image. We have the boundary layer and it's a very complex structure. And let's just visualize now the flow profile. We have the profiles here again. You can see velocity on the wall is zero. And then we have this profile here and here we have the free stream velocity. And you can see that two things. First of all, we have a very high gradient in y direction, normal to the surface, but a very small gradient in x direction. And another thing you can see is that on the left picture maybe this is a very complex structure. And since we have such a high gradient, as you know, we need to use a very fine mesh. But now we have a problem because um, this is all fine, but what is the right size and I will just I would like in the next two minutes just to introduce it to wall modeling which is very important because if you model your walls the wrong way you will get massively wrong results because not only the modeling of your wall is, wall is wrong but also everything around it because you know in a CFD simulation everything is depending from each other so uh, but I have good news for you there are it's basically very easy to make sure that you are modeling the wall the right way. And uh, to put it in a nutshell, there were a lot of scientists which investigated what was happening in the um, boundary layer. You may heard about the na name Schlichting or other very important um, scientists which uh, worked in this area. And they found something out which is very interesting that there was something they call the law of the wall. <coughs> Basically what they did, they measured velocity profiles themselves for flows over a plate and then they tried to understand what is happening there and then they calculated or made everything dimensionless. The velocity 
as well as the distance to the wall. And then they got what they got was a dimensionless velocity profile. You can see here. And um, basically, this is our profile. It's a logarithmic representation, therefore it looks maybe a little bit strange. It's, it's not like the profile we found on, the, on this slide, but that's because this is logarithmic representation. And um, basically, and this is the most important thing, they found out that you can um, or this this uh, uh, law of wall can be represented also by um, use several functions and overlay them. And one of them is this viscous supply you can see here. And basically, what the, the idea of them is to put the whole viscous sublayer into the first cell of your mesh. So this here. to put it into the first cell. And if you put this into the first cell, you can just use uh, 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 this log law of wall, this profile we have, to model the velocity profile instead of, of calculating it. And let's talk a little bit about the difference because that is very important and therefore I will just go back one slide one second sorry guys okay let's talk about the difference let's say this is our this is a wall This is our first cell. If we don't use the velocity profile, we will have only like a value. Let's do the profile like this. Then we would only have a value here, a value here at zero, and that will be our profile. Not very exact, because we have just two points. Um, but so if we want to have the full wall boundary layer profile we have to add more cells which can take a lot of computational time but and that's a good thing if we use this this law of wall we know that we can apply this log logarithmic function and then even if we don't only have two points we can calculate the full profile here and the only there's only one thing you have to make sure this law of wall is only valid if the dimensionless wall distance of your first cell is between 30 and 300 and if it's not like that you have to make sure that your y plus is 1 which will make your cells much smaller so there are basically two options. A very, very, let's say, um, exact solution you, you, with, without using without wall, with solving it without wall functions, and using wall functions, which have nearly the same precision, but only a fraction of the computational effort. Great. And just keep this in mind, because this is the reason why we use this dedicated settings for the layers. And there are two other things I will talk to you about today. Because uh, today we want to make a full car simulation. And there are two aspects we have to, or two, two things uh, we have to be careful with. First of all, your cars have radiators. And I think if you, if you ever have a, had a radiator in your hand yourself, you know how small and fragile the structures there are. And it would be impossible to um, mesh a radiator completely. Or it would be maybe possible, but would make no sense, absolutely no sense. Therefore, we need an approach 
to include the effect of the radiator because the radiator will result in a pressure drop without being forced to, to model the whole radiator. And there is a very nice approach which is called porous media. Here the idea is we will assume that the radiator is not a radiator but a porous zone like a sponge. And you may hear it about Darcy's law which is uh, uh, usually used for describe diffusion or other passive transport properties but you can also use it for describe um, porous media. And in the end what we will do, or the idea of Darcy's law is, instead of simulating my whole radiator, I will just use some test data which you will get from the um, a manufacturer of the radiator and you only need a diagram showing how the pressure drop is depending on the uh, free stream velocity or the mass flow. And this will give you a curve like this which you can represent with a quadratic function. So it's a nonlinear function second order. And now we can use A and B the coefficients to describe our radiator completely. So we just have to calculate F and D based on, on, the, on the equation which fits into our count points and then we can model the radiator that way. And just to, for you to understand, again let's make a, a short sketch, let's say very simple example. This is a pipe and in this pipe I have in red a radiator. And if you would take a look, let's say, you would see this very small structures in the radiator we cannot mesh. But instead of meshing them, we will just remove the radiator as a physical part and replace it, you can see it here, with a porous zone. And like we use another material properties here. And then we will have the same pressure drop like we would have if we would use or model the full radiator. And you can apply this approach for nearly everything. Um, for nearly uh, everything where you have a pressure drop. Not only for a radiator but also for a filter or something else. And in the end if you want to include radiator to your simulation you just need this graph calculate F and D based on these equations. So we have F is, it's a vector for sure because we have three components but in, in the end we, uh, it's uh, 2A divided by the density and what you can see here is the normal vector. The reason is just imagine our pipe is not, our uh, radiator in the pipe has maybe a different angle and it's looking let's say like this. And then you just need a local coordinate system. I see there are some questions, so I'll try to answer some right now. First of all, um, what are the the question by um, Aaron? If you could describe what the percentage and the mass flow to pressure graph are. Yes, these are just uh, different densities of the of the channels uh, in the radiator. It's a diagram I used from an old publication. So basically you have to don't care every of this curve is representing a different different radiator. 
and uh, Sumit wants to know um, what is there in the diagram. So we have here mass flow or velocity and here we have the pressure drop so between this and this point we have delta P and flow is coming in with this velocity here. I hope it's clear now. Um, yes, um, that a lot of question seems a lot of question be related to A and B. So guys, basically, don't be confused. Um, you will get. Let's say you will you will you would you just buy a radiator, put it into a test rig, and you will get and measure different pressure drops for different mass flows. Then you will get points. And what you'll do actually, you just look, you will fit a function looking like this. A, uh, this dp, fit A and B so that it fulfills the points, going through the points, as, and then you get A and B. And with A and B, you can calculate F and D. And F and D are required as an input on the simulation tool. And um, this is density, this is viscosity, and this is, sorry, ED, <laughs> and this are the normal vectors. Okay, but if you have question regarding that, we will write a better explanation in the forum. And we will explain it during the live demo, so don't worry. Next thing I want to talk with you about, which is also very important, is wheel modeling. I think we had this discussion in the forum already about the, the moving floor, right? And it's basically the same thing. And um, the biggest challenge here is again uh, to, to make a simulation efficient, we will do steady state simulations, but in reality the car is moving and therefore the tires and the rims are rotating. Another problem is in a static simulation with a static grid we cannot model this rotation of the wheel. And therefore we need their different approach because the interaction between the wheel and for a formula car, for an open wheel car, very important. And what you can see here, it's basically three times the same simulation of the same car with uh, similar mesh settings. The only difference is there was one simulation with complete static wheels, one simulation where we have applied a wall velocity on the tires and one simulation where we have applied something which we call MRF. We will talk about this uh, just in some seconds, what it means MRF. But let me just write it down. Stat static rotating wall MRF. Let's first of all take a look at the, at the table. We can see for the front and rear wheel lift and drag. And for the complete static case, the lift is 6 Newton. And for rotate a case with rotating wheels, it's between 3.4 3 and 3.7, which is a difference of 30 per 30 percent. I know the absolute value is not very big, but the uh, relative value for or, uh, only for the wheel. And it's the same um, if you take a look at the drag. At the rear wing, we have the same effect. It just a little bit weaker because the rear wing usually is not so much interaction with the free stream. And what you can see here is that we can massively increase or that it is a big uh, impact on the on the final result how we model the wheels. And to make it short, we would uh, or we would um, we prefer to use this approach here. 
which is called MRF. And MRF is for multiple reference frame. And what MRF is doing is, just imagine, um, in reality, the car is driving through the air, so the reels are rotating in the rim. Therefore, a rotating wall velocity is needed on the tire and the rim to account uh, this, this into effect. But if you take this think about the rim, the rim is working like a pump and adding this um, uh, velocity on the on the wall only will not add the full radial component uh, which is added in reality to the flow field by the rotation of the rims. And therefore what we do here is we uh, MRF, or what MRF is doing in the end is, and you can see it in this image, um, we're separating some cells inside the rim, marked in green, and for this cells we will apply an um, additional term which is uh, 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 taking account the rotational forces on the fluid elements. And therefore this helps to increase massively the result quality. Um, then there are some questions I would like to answer right now. First of all by Thomas. Um, is there a method of simplifying a flow around a corrugated wall similar to porous media without modeling the corrugation? Or uh, a flat wall should be just modeled where the corrugation peaks are? Um, it depends. Um, I would like to answer this question one minute, Thomas, because I think it's related to another question. So, first of all, Joshua wants to know, um, does, the, uh, does the MRF approach capture the effect of the rim at all angles, or does it only consider the aerodynamic effect of the ring at a single angle? Um, I think, Daniel, you're talking about different steering angles and different flow angles, right? Um, if you have a steering angle, you have to adapt the MRF zone for sure. But... Um, uh, in general, yes, you ca it capture it can be or MRF can be used for for let's say all uh, um, flow angles. And um, yes, okay. Then let's go back to the question of um, Thomas. Um, for corrugated face surfaces, it depends. Basically, what we can do is modeling surface roughness, which is, I think, according to a corrugated wall. That is possible, but that is a different approach, which has nothing to do with MRF. But if you're interested in that, my colleagues can send you on the chat a, a link where you can read about it. It's also possible with SimScale. Next question, Sebastian. Is it able to simulate fans and blow for use in a cooling system? Definitely. You cannot. You can combine MRF, for example, and a, a, a porous zone to have a radiator as well as the fan. Next question is by Savas. Savas say, oh, Savas seems to be an expert. When meshing for MRF, I mesh only the gap between the rim spokes. And that's, by the way, the right approach. But I have quality problems. Shall I mesh a bigger volume or will I have a problem? Savas, that's a question a lot of people are arguing about. From my experience, uh, and uh, uh, I also worked as a professional CFD engineer in motorsports, um, I would say, yes, yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> You should not make it make it too big because what the problem is basically, we can see it here. Um, the MRF zone basically is adding too much of uh, such effects. Therefore, we have to be very careful where we apply it. And this very strong radial pump effect is only happening in the knee of the rim. Therefore, if you make it bigger, you would add too much of this rotational effects. And I would uh, suggest to do it only for the between the rim spokes, as I will show it to you later. And if you have mesh pin quality problems, just make the surface mesh finer there. Okay, then let's continue. And I think we are nearly done with the fundamental stuff and we can start with our live demo. Great, so um, if you have questions, just write them down and I will answer them during the present uh, the live demo or later at the Q&A. And first of all, you know me and I've prepared something. 
Um, so this is a project I will share later on also with you, including uh, a, a model, a half, uh, a, a half symmetrical model of the f ra racing car from S3 team from Siegen. Let's open the project and right now we will together set up the simulation. Let's first of all take a look. Um, so we have the car. What you can see here, we have the inlet, which is red, green the outlet. Blue, the blue wall is, it's basically a very equal, similar setup to the setup we used last time. So blue will be again a, a frictionless wall and brown will be a symmetrical plane. And what we will do right now, we will uh, pre-process the model, so we will mesh it. We will set up the simulation and then I will show you some more post-processing. Okay, then let's start. Um, so this is the project. You can import it later also to your um, own uh, project uh, workspace for the homework. And what you can see here is the model. And we imported this as a STL model, as a file format also used for uh, 3D printing, tessellated format. And let's take a look first of all at the model structure, which is very important. We will talk about this at the la uh, final session uh, on December 19th, but this can help having the right structure with the CAD model can reduce a lot of work. So here you can see we have a single face for every wing section or wing profile. And first of all, what I would like to show you is um, this, this and this body. Because actually, let's hide them. Here we have our rims. And um, this is uh, what we're adding here is the actual the MRF zone, which we'll use later on for meshing. That's very important. You need to create the dummies for your MRF zone and your porous zone in advance in your CAD system. But now let's start to create the mesh. First of all, I will create a new mesh. Click on the new mesh item. Um, and we will keep the name and we have to choose the geometry first of all. Now the geometry was added and the next step is to add a mesh operation. And again, we will add um, hex dominant parametric meshing so that we have the full control. Click on save and it will be added. Um, to your um, workspace, uh, we'll add it to your workspace. Okay. Next thing is we will first of all, as you know, define our bounding box. And um, um, yes, let's start. Um, first of all, we will define it again with um, minimum maximum points. And just if you ask yourself why we're using values like minus 9.825, um, it's because of the cell size. And the only thing you have to make sure is that um, later on you will see, uh, you will understand it more, is that your bounding box is large enough. Um, therefore, let's just just add the missing coordinates. Here I use. 0 0.001 instead of um, 0 because I want to avoid that if just one point of this geometry is not on the symmetrical plane, the meshing could become, uh, mesh could run into problems. Therefore, just for, for, for stability issues, um, then we also, let's add, let me add the max points. And now we have our bounding box. This is the minimum size I would recommend. You can also make it larger, but this should be fine for our first try. And uh, one thing which is very important, we will talk about it also more next week, but something which is called tire contact patch, you can see it here. Because actually, if um, we would not have this part, the, there would be just one infinite uh, uh, thin line where the tire is standing on the floor and therefore we use this patch to have a better connection. 
Great, so the next thing is to add the material point, so define where we want to keep the mesh later on. I will just use this coordinate. And then you know we have to define our base mesh size, so go back to the operation and um, here we want next direction 105 cells and in Y in that direction 30 cells which will re uh, result in a um, effective element size of 20 cent around 20 centimeter. Now let's add two refinement zones around the car so I will create new Cartesian box first of all rename it to lower and then again define it so this is our small refinement box and I will add a second one we can just duplicate this one and modify the value Now we have a good refined box around our car. Um, great. Then let me just answer some questions in the meantime. Um, Eva Maria wants to know, uh, should the cat of the car be a negative body, which is subtracted by a boom operation of the fluid volume, or should be a real body intersecting the fluid? Eva, Eva you can decide, but we recommend to use the real body. Debra wants to know what is the material point coordinate. Okay, we talked about it last week, but let's just talk about it very quickly. Right now we are creating a mesh for this whole background mesh box. But the computer has to decide in the end which is the inner part of the mesh. Do we want to smash the inner volume of the car or the air around the car and this is done by the material point. Here the material point is you can see it, wait one second, this is our material point here and it's outside and therefore let's make sure that we mesh the right part. Great and um, Sumit wants to know why two different refinement boxes I want to save elements, that's a very simple answer and I think that the wake will be or the region of the flow which will be affected by the by the car is around here so I'm just saving elements in the end. So it's and just to, to make sure that there are no, no confusions, this is the domain, fluid domain, Back, this is our fluid flow domain and this two other box I just created because I will later use them to add a regional refinement for the mesh. Um, you can also use boolean function but I would not recommend it because it will make it much more complex but if you're interested I know guys you want to know how to upload and simulate your model but we really make some thoughts about the structure of this course and believe me latest on December 19 we will talk massively about how is how the best way to import your model, to maintain your model, to simulate your model. Don't worry. Okay, this is done, so we can actually start to define the mesh. So we have to define refinements. And just remember we start with the space mesh box, a uh, base mesh size which is about 20 centimeter and now with every refinement level the cells will be splitted. So let's first of all start with a surface refinement for the body, the wing and plate. The, here we have the outer support of the radiator, the diffuser, the driver. By the way, it's very important to add a surface refinement to every surface, otherwise it will be ignored during meshing. And we will add, or we, have, we want to have a surface refinement here between 5 and 6. Great, this is done. 
Let's now create a second surface refinement, which is a little bit higher, 6 to 7, and apply it on all surfaces, all wings, sorry, the wheels, the suspension, and the bars. And we need another surface refinement for the side pod. This can be a little bit coarser and we need a surface refinement for the missing surfaces. So, for the wheel hubs here, the uprights here and here, and the tire, so-called tire contact patch here. Great. Next thing is to add a feature refinement to resolve the edges also. The include degree is fine. With this degree you can define what should be treated like an edge and what not. And then we will just add two refinements of for different distances. So one millimeter away from the edges, the cell level should be eight. And five millimeter it should be six. And uh, yes, then now we can start with our MRF zones. Okay, let me hide these two volumes. We will now create a cell zone, extract a cell zone around the spokes of the rim. So let's call it MRF F for front wheel. Again, surface refinement, faces. Then we will select only this one. And very important, here you have to go on true. And then this face will also not be a physical face. You will not see it later on in the mesh. It, and it, and um, you have to add here a cell level and give it a name. Done. We will do the same for the rear wheel. and create a cell zone and we will finally do the same for the radiator here you see and maybe we can let me isolate the selection we replace the radiator by this dummy and this will be made a porous body right now so surface Create again a cell zone. And finally, I will add the region refinement. And last but not least, we will add layers. Oh. <laughs> Wrong button I clicked. We also need layers on the car. And we use inflate boundary layer and we'll apply it everywhere except our cell zones. So we will invert our selection and this values, because some people asked, 
uh, just in general. Um, there is not a right answer for the right mesh size uh, uh, for your car. We will provide you, this setup can be adapted in the end to every car. And we will provide you also uh, later on with ex extra tool to calculate the cell, uh, the cell uh, resolution yourself and especially these parameters which are describing how the boundary uh, uh, layers will be extruded. So here we will use three layers expansion uh, ratio of 1.05 0.45 should be the final layer thickness and these are all relative values and they will be calculated based on the local surface cell size which will be extruded and we will add also layers on the floor there we will use bounding box layer addition choose that min again three elements and Yes, and um, great, then we are done with our mesh definition. Let's go some, through some of the questions. Um, first of all, uh, the, you can um, just visualize your selection by clicking Select Assignment and go on the related um, uh, refinement item, just someone asked. And some some people say I missed the front flap, but that's not true. If you take a look, ah, I know. Yes, I forgot it. You're right, guys. Great. <laughs> Thank you for. So you can just expand selection, click and add, add on selection, it will be done. Thank you for taking uh, so much care. Uh, then there, are, Pascal wants to know why there is a gap between the side pot and the kick up. Uh, sorry, Pascal, what do you mean with with kick up? Sorry, I never hear this word. So basically, there is not a gap. Um, I mean, this one, it's based on the original cat data. But, um, yes, this model is watertight. That is very important. And Thomas wants to know if the hub rotating region is subtracted from the surrounding mesh or they overlap. No, they will be subtracted. So, that will work. Uh, great. Okay, then we can start our mesh operation by clicking on Start. And um, then the mesh will be computed. Since this can take time, for sure, I have prepared something for you. So a project including a ready to use mesh. Let's open the project. And here you can see it. Great. So same geometry. And here is the mesh. It's loading. Dimitros asked a very good question. <clears throat> what happens if we use MROF on the actual rims? I think you mean what happens if you create a cell zone with the actual rims. I can tell you what will happen. Your rims will be replaced with air. Your rims will be lost. <laughs> okay, now the mesh is loading. It can take a little bit of time since these are, I think, 9 million cells, which is little. It's, 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 this is a lot. And first of all, yes, this is our final mesh. So let's... And there are some things I would like to show you. First of all, you can see here we have different cell zones. So we have one cell zone, which is including the fluid part of the mesh. We can also take a look inside if you want, which is including in the end the car, everything else. And we have also other regions. First of all, we have the radiator region. This is a visualization issue. Basically, it's a closed 
closed region for the radiator and we have the same for the front and wheel MRF zone, which you can see here. So if we now take a look, let's take a look at the surface mesh for example by hiding the bounding boxes and then you can see the surface mass which was automatically refined in the so here on the wings we have the finer mesh and on the side part it's coarser we can change also the representation to surfaces and then you see the quite high quality of the CFD model of this mesh Um okay. Um yes. Um then I would say let's start to set up actually the actual simulation. The setup is very, very similar to the setup from last last week, so I will rush a little bit through it and then we will talk more about the differences. First of all, I have to change choose again the solver. Or, uh, we will uh, use fluid dynamic simulation, incompressible, use the K army the SST model I talked about uh, before and we want to simulate steady state, that's fine. Click on save and everything will be added. You have then to select the mesh and um, okay. it will take some seconds. Um, in the meantime, let's answer some questions. Um, Krupesh wants to know how to add the porous material. That's what we're going to do right now. But first of all, we need to prepare the mesh for that. Um, someone wants to know what kind of method you are using to generate the mesh. Uh, we are using a Snappy X mesh. It's a, a tool, a open source meshing tool, part of OpenForm, which is also used in Formula 1 by Zauber F1, for example, and Ferrari and Mercedes AMG. Um, and Varun wants to know for the meshing if the model needs to be solid or it can be hollow. Basically it can be hollow <laughs> but the only important thing is it's watertight. But I would, as I mentioned Varun, we will talk about this more in detail in the last session and then you will learn how to create a nice model, a nice CAD model. First of all we have to assign a, a material and now you can see uh, compared to last time we have four regions volumes now and this is very important. Only apply it to region 0 which is our default fluid region. The radiator is not air and first of all we'll import a material model for air, click here, assign it and we are done. Uh, next we have to define the initial values for K and Omega which are later on also used to uh, automatically calculate K and Omega for, for, for the boundary conditions. So um, I just calculated it myself with some formulas K is 0 0.06 and Omega is 44.7. We'll show you in the uh, last week how to calculate this on your own and provide you with the tool. Next step is to define boundary conditions and most of the boundary conditions are very similar. We have the inlet 20 meters per second oh. we have the outlet Since Nicholas asked, yes, there will be another tutorial for setting up the geometry in the CAD model. Yes, definitely. And then we will add for the side walls this frictionless slip walls. And sorry, I was too fast for the symmetry for sure 
we will add a symmetry boundary condition and so on and so on. And now it will become interesting. First of all, according to the discussion in the forum, we will add uh, also here a boundary condition to the floor. And now it will be you now it's uh, it will become a little bit more complex. Let's first of all hide all boundary condition we already find and take now a look at our model and hide also real wheel. Very important is only apply boundary conditions to the boundary of the fluid mesh itself, not for the radiator zones and not for the MRF zones. Because these are only interfaces which will be not used for the further calculation as walls. Um, and here basically first of all we can apply for the car body for all static parts we have the standard wall boundary condition of a, of a no slip wall so we will it's uh, we will um, first of all invert our selection so we select everything expect the wheels also the contact patches and save and now we have to define first of all the rotation of the front and the rear wheel. So let's call it uh, front FV for front wheel. Select the wheel, wall, rotating wall velocity. And then we have to add here first of all the origin. of the wheel, then the rotational axis, which is y, and then the angular velocity, which you can calculate based on the velocity. And by the way, this is following the right-hand rule. So if you want to know what's the positive and negative direction of rotation. Uh, then we will add it finally on the front wheel. We have to do the same. For the rear wheel, there we have for sure other coordinates for x. But the axis is the same and the rotational will speed also. And now we are done with the boundary conditions. Finally, we will create our cell zones. And so we will start with the uh, rotating zones for the MRF zone. So let's call with, uh, here we can change multiple reference zone, MRF front, select front wheel zone. And very important, you have to select here the full volume, not only the surface. So, and then we, can, we have to enter. It's the same way, just like for the rotation boundary condition, rotating wall boundary condition. We have to enter the coordinates. The same here. <laughs> and we are done. Finally, let's add the porous zone. So First of all, we will select the radiator zone. Wait, I have to clear my selection here. So we will to take the radiator. Then we have to define the coordinate system. 
So this are E1, E1 and E3 are the normal, that are the, let's say, local coordinate system of my porous media. So I will just um, enter it. Ah, sorry. And then we will just add values for D and F in all directions. What I, what I did basically, I calculated D and F for the main flow direction and for the other two directions basically uh, there is no porosity. But we cannot define the infinite high porosity, therefore we will first of all define the real porosity, let's say, in X direction and then we will just use a little bit higher value here and here to make sure that it's not uh, that, that we have the main flow direction correctly and here it's the same 1.08 basically and here we'll just use 108 for the other two directions great we're done uh, basically we can modify some numerics to make the simulation more stable or also add result, result control items but I would prefer to create the simulation and start it and this simulation will take about three hours Therefore, I have prepared uh, something for you. Uh, so once the simulation is finished, you will get not will get the notification. And yes, and then you can switch to the post processor. And since we're running out of time, let's make it quickly. I just added the simulation result already to the post processor. And then, for example, we can take a look at the pressure distribution on the car we can also create streamlines which can take a little bit more time and so on and so on and that's done. You know also that we can uh, get the forces from our forces plot and then we can use this data basically to develop the car which we will show you next week. Here for example I just just define a source Since uh, you asked um, regarding the detailed settings for numerics, we will provide you again with a step-by-step -step tutorial where you can read everything. And I, for example, now created streamlines very easily. Yes, and that's it. Um, great, then I would say let's just do a quick wrap-up. Um, I showed you how to create a mesh and especially how to create cell zones which is very very important. Next thing we talked about was um, set up the simulation was basically the same procedure uh, like last time but we had additional boundary conditions for the rotating wheels and additional uh, settings we have to had to make for the cell zones for MRF zone and uh, the radiator and final step is visualization um, yes then I would like to present your homework to you and then we have time for a Q&A so your homework will be to investigate yourself and um, the effect of 
uh, bottling, porous media and for radiator and MRF zones for the rotating wheels. So you will get a, a project link from me, a tutorial from me, we'll find it on uh, in the forum from tomorrow on and then you will set up, create two meshes and set up three simulations so it's less work than last time. And again you will have one week time for that. And yes, uh, this is nearly, I would say, the last step and from next week, as I mentioned, we will really start together to develop the car based on simulation. So now it's time for, your Q and, for the q and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much for being here, for those of you who have to leave. And yes, I will start. So, um... Oh, Miyakai wants to know what's the overall drag and downforce value for the setup, if I can tell you. Yes, for sure I can tell you. Let's just switch to the force plot. And for example, I have not calculated this for the whole car. I have to add it. But um, basically, for example, the downforce generated by the front wing is around 4 kilograms, the drag is around um, 1 kilogram. And the overall force that you can find out yourself, but I think it was something like 50 kilo of the force, but I'm not sure. Ricardo wants to know what's about cornering. We will talk about cornering also uh, with my, like next week. Um, and also if there are any tricks and hints if you should be aware. Basically, no, guys. Uh, just make the homework, uh, uh, attend to the lessons. When you don't know something, just write in the forum. And next week, and especially the final week, we will really start to talk about hands-on things. Um, William wants to know why the angular velocity is positive. Um, it's because the right-hand rule. You may heard about it that we are using this right-hand rule because uh, uh, to define uh, what is positive and negative. Okay, Tejo wants to know if I can just briefly explain MRF again. Let's do that. For that, let me just open a paint window. What we're doing with MRF is basically, let's make an easier example. Just think we have a propeller. A propeller looking like This. Okay. Sorry. Let's say we have a propeller here. And we want to simulate what happens if this propeller will rotate in this vessel. And we're looking on it from top. Right. One option would be, and it would be very stupid, or not stupid but very inefficient, would be to create a very complex mesh which can rotate, actually. Other option is what we call MRF, to say the rotor will stand static and we will uh, artificially add this rotational component from outside. And that is basically MRF. Then we will add this manually. Okay. If Maria said uh, also more question um um, okay, just want some general. If the tutorial is not explaining something, how to change something, you should just use the, the um, default value. How, uh, Tanai wants to know how essential is getting the entire car boundary um, value, boundary layer values for Y plus between 30 and 300, and what if some regions are above and some below 30? Tanai, that's a good question. It's very essential. It's very important. So you should really take care. For sure, if some cells are below 30 or larger than 300, it's not a big deal. But in general, really the majority, 99% of the cells should be in this range. 
Um, okay, um, Eva Maria say you talked about the possibility to simulate the cooling system with SimScale, but if I do have a closed tube system and regarding fluid dynamics theory, I need to take care of the tube hydraulics. How can I bring these values into SimScale? Eva, can you explain your question a little bit more? What do you mean with with tube hydraulics? EK wants to know if it can be measured, the volumetric flow rate entering the radiator. Yes, it's possible. I will, we can sh uh, show it to you next time, but you have to do vocal processing for that. And we will also, sh and if you want to know how to collect poro poro uh, porosity values, um, I explained that during the session and we will just show you, give you later on a tool you can use. Great. Eva, um, if you are, it seems that you're not my here, uh, Please send me a question or get, post a question again in the forum, then we can talk about it. Ah, I know God what you mean, F. <laughs> um, what you would do basically, if I, is to take a test rig, measure it in a test rig, and just assume that there is no difference between the test rig and the real. Uh, real application. There is for sure a difference, but we will like neglect it. Okay, final question is um, by Aziz, how to check the Y plus value? That is very easy if it was calculated. So if you want to calculate or see Y plus, you have to make sure that Y plus was calculated as a f uh, field. Then you can just go on the solution field here. Then we end um, Unfortunately, here it was not computed, but then you can just select it as a own field. Last question of David. Some aerodynamists were, uh, when uh, perform CFD simulation with a yaw angle of one degree. Can you explain me why? Yes, I can, David. Because um, actually a flow around a symmetrical body is not symmetric in any case in, r in real world and applying this your angle uh, uh, can show you some interesting things but basically you will you use this your angles to understand how your car will react on side wind and by the way I don't want to talk too much but this kind of your wind, stud your, uh, wind studies is what we will do next week guys thank you very much for being here if you have more questions just write to the forum hope to see you next week it was great have a nice day see you soon bye